Good morning, colleagues. Um, I'm Fatima from Sadi, as you've been introduced previously. Um, I'm afraid Delicia was supposed to be chairing the session. She's not in our supposed to be support. So yeah, you're in my hands for the session. Um, we have participants all from Vetsera presenting. That's my alma mater. So I'm quite proud to be chairing the session. Uh, and yeah, there's four papers to be presented. I see people are still coming in. Some of the presenters, Dan is in, Innocence here, great. So all our paper presenters are in. Okay, so just house rules, 20 minutes, I think, for the presentation, and then we'll keep question and, question and answers thereafter. Please use the chat or raise your hands. I don't have a session support person here. So yeah, we'll see how we fare with this. Okay, then the first paper will be Zepiso Sia Samkela Aneshri and Bomgeni Shungube from the University of North Vardis Front talking about academic advising engaging towards success. Zepiso, over to you. Thank you, Fatima. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sia, who's going to get us started. Great. Uh, sorry, just before you begin. Okay. Uh, okay, we are recording the session. That's fine. Thank you. Sorry about that. Sia, you can continue. Not a problem. Thank you so much, Fatima, and thank you so much as well. Good morning, colleagues, and thank you for attending our session. So as you may have seen from yesterday's program, student voice is one topic that has been presented on by different institutions. And we've also had a privilege of um, hearing students or hearing from students themselves talking about their inclusion in student success. So this confirms without a doubt to the importance of student voice in academic success. So my name is Yasam Gela Chinoyi. I'm here with my colleagues, Mr. Tepiso Maliswena, Mr. Mbongeni Shukungube, and Anish Nayega. So we are the academic advisors in Bates University under the teaching and learning unit in one of the faculties, which is specifically CLM faculty. So we'll be presenting to you the intervention we had on student voice titled Academic Advisors Engaging Towards Success, Student and Lecturer Interaction in a Town Hall. So everyone, as everyone else who presented on the topic and supported by empirical uh, evidence, we also concur that student voice is indeed missing in practices that concern students in higher education. So in playing our role in student uh, inclusion, in, in, in inclusion of student voice and uh, in, in interventions and practices that concern them. So we thought we'll specifically focus on student lecturer relationship. And the reason for this, we believe that lecturers or academic staff, they play a crucial role in student um, relationship. And further that, to that, we also identified that there's a, a, a gap in relationship in, in the relationship between students and um, academic advisor rather the the academic staff and they this relationship is kind of like characterized by a lot of misperception misperception between the two parties so we sought to create a safe controlled space where students could express their concerns to their lecturers in a town hall so why did we do this? Why was it important to us to have this particular intervention? So we thought it has a potential to mitigate the misperception between the two parties, which is students and um, academic staff. We also wanted to amplify the student voices in practices that concern them, particularly focusing on teaching practice. We also thought that this kind of engagement would foster an environment that encourages students to speak up about their concerns, challenges, and also even give positive feedback to their lecturers. And in return, also help academic staff to reflect on their practice. So now I'm going to hand over to my colleagues, Ms. Maliswane, um, Mr. Mbongeni Shungube, and uh, Anish Nayega, who will be presenting um, through the findings and way forward. Over to you, Tepisa. Thank you. There we go. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for that um, intro, Sia. As Sia has already stated, my name is Tepi Somaliswena, and I'll be discussing the data collection methods that we have employed, as well as the limitations that we encountered in this process. Starting with the data collection, um, ours is a research, it's a qualitative research project. And um, of the three phases being the town hall, uh, with students and staff, the webinars with only staff members and the focus groups that we had with only just the students. We collected data during the focus groups only because of the, the issue of ethical clearance. So ethical clearance was only granted to us to use the focus group data for when we do the write. So for the town hall and the webinar session that we had with academics, we will be giving a general overview, but we won't be including individual responses. Those will only be limited to the focus groups. So after the webinars, um, so after the town halls, we had webinars with schools. And after the webinars with the schools and the academic staff, we gave the schools some time to implement um, the student recommendations, to make amendments to processes, and to implement new teaching and learning strategies. Um, and other issues that the students may have raised, we, we gave the school some time to go back as a unit or as a school to talk and reflect and see what it is that, that they can do. The focus groups were then held with students post this um, intervention period to discuss these changes, um, that there are changes that were made and changes that were not made. We, in those focus groups, adopted a semi-structured semi semi interviewing style where we prompted the students to reflect on their respective town hall experiences. And we also encouraged them um, in that session to have an open discussion about what they what their needs were, where, whether those needs were met, um, and just a, a reflective, basically a general reflective conversation. Um, as I said, not too much structuring, letting the students leave the section, um, reflecting on the experiences of the town hall. So moving on to the limitations of this research project, um, the first limitation that we noticed is that um, student attendance uh, was an issue um, in some of the town halls where some schools, we had to really prompt those students to come. Um, some schools, it was very easy to get students to come, but others, um, and for issues, I will, I will elaborate further when I talk about um, the school, when I start talking about the response letters from the schools, but attendance was an issue. Um, resistance to feedback by the schools was then translated to resistance to change. So um, some of the issues and, and the feedback given were uh, perceived by the schools as negative. And um, that perception then made the schools quite resistant to then implementing any, any said changes. Um, then there were also policy bureaucratic roadblocks, um, which actually um, beyond the limits of what the school could do. So there were certain issues that as much as the school would have wanted to address them at the time, they could not do because of these much broader policy issues that they were constrained by. Finally, um, another limitation that we perceived was an apprehension from the, from the students um, during these town hall sessions from you know, a fear of victimization and fears that um, the lecturers might then um, target them after hearing some of the feedback or some of the things that they had to say. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to pause it there and hand over to my colleague Mbongeni, who's going to talk about um, the next part. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Tepiso. Um, so I'll be discussing the concerns raised by the students in the town hall. Uh, so, um, Although uh, students could raise anything, it was it was placed within four themes. So uh, the themes were learning support challenges, online learning experiences, assessment related concerns, and teaching and learning concerns. So under learning support challenges, students um, raised that lecturers' consideration of the their experiences uh, during the ex uh, 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 epidemic was uh, was lacking. So, um, for instance, there was a change in uh, the way students were, were learning um, and also the experiences that they were having at home, like death in the family, maybe students are dealing with death in the family or they have more responsibilities. So that really did impact on the way in which they, they were learning. So students did feel like student, uh, lecturers did not really consider those changes uh, which are normally not there in their normal uh, learning experiences. So 
yeah, in, in that we see the social economic background uh, at play. So those type of consideration. Another um, challenge that students raised was the lack of response or slow responses. So students felt like uh, lectures took too long to respond to their concerns or challenges that they were experiencing, um, which obviously differs from how they normally access uh, lectures during um, physical learning, where they could just speak to the lecturer after class or easily go to, um, to, to their offices. So um, one other big issue that student uh, raised was the feeling that lecturers did not care um, so it was also raised in, in this um, conference that students often feel alienation. So this is what uh, also came up. So in terms of learning experiences, um, what students raised was their data and connectivity concerns. So we all know that students had to learn online and then this was really an issue because it also tend to affect uh, student submissions. And also, it it also was a, a amplification of uh, the social economic challenges that certain students were experiencing. So um, another issue that they raised was the quality of the uh, online content. What students felt was that um, one, they were given more in, uh, information to deal with uh, as it compared to how it was in physical learning. So lectures automatically assume that because they're learning online, they have more time. So they give them more work. So uh, that was a challenge as well. And another challenge in the online learning experience was um, the detachment um, of lecturers uh, to students. Like that also speaks to how students feel uh, alienated in, in the process of learning uh, during the online learning. So another concerns, um, uh, rather another theme, which was the assessment and uh, assessment related concerns. Student raised um, the fact that uh, the timetables were, were unreasonable, which is something that I also highlighted in terms of the online learning experiences. Uh, timetables were unreasonable. You're writing today, you're writing the following day, but really the circumstances had, had changed in how uh, you're learning. So um, they also raised uh, other issues as sub-minimum rules uh, still in place in despite the, the time and, and, and period in which they were learning. And they also perceived unfair assessment practices and lack of adequate feedback. So when they got feedback, it was not giving them enough for them to, to change or to know exactly what to change. So on the last theme, uh, that in, in relation to teaching and learning. So uh, students raised the fact that uh, poor teaching and learning practices are in place in, in, in university. And uh, in one of the things that they raised there is that uh, lecturers need to be trained to, to, to be teachers. So I don't know, in most universities, lecturers are normally using the same practices of teaching that they have been uh, experiencing as students because there's not really a way or not much expectation in, in lecturers uh, really learning how to teach in university spaces, which also speaks to the uh, issue of them learning how to care in these spaces. Uh, so at this moment, I would like to hand over, hand over back to Tsepiso. Uh, she will discuss um, further uh, on, in terms of the communication from the uh, academics. Thank you so much, um, Bongi, for that intro. So I will be now focusing on the responses from the schools. So um, after, after, as, as already been, um, explained, after the, the town halls, the, we gave the schools some time to implement the recommendations and the changes. And there were then subsequent letters that were sent out to the schools addressing what changes had been implemented and addressing you know, the experience at the town hall. So um, this was quite an exciting part of the research project where we as researchers, as, as advisors, could quite clearly observe um, the limitations and the progress that was made um, in the town halls. So of the four schools that, held, that we held town halls with, 
two responded and I will briefly explain why this was. So um, the one school, so it, the responses were not because both of the two schools that did not respond um, was due to some resistance. The one school um, is a fairly new school. So the student attendance, when we were speaking about the low attendance, that's the one school that really struggled with attendance. And then the other school um, did not respond and that was now speaking to the, the feedback that came out. They were quite, um, they, they were quite unhappy, for lack of a better term, about the, the feedback that they received. So there was no letter that was generated at the end addressing um, the issues that students had raised. Um, and then which led the two schools that did um, respond. So both of those schools expressed gratitude to students for their attendance and their participation. What we really liked is that they validated the students. They were not dismissive of their challenges or the concerns. Um, and this is reflected in the letters that they then wrote to, to, in, to their students. Um, these letters also depicted an effort on the part of the school to address the teaching and learning concerns raised. Um, the school culture also came across quite strongly in the letters. So for example, the one school being, being a law school was quite detailed, um, you know, outlining processes and things like that. But that spoke to, you could see that this actually spoke to the, the nature of the school itself. So it was very interesting detail for us. And then um, as I had briefly touched on it, the school were very transparent. Both schools were transparent about the, you know, the extent of their powers and that there were some policy issues or bureaucratic issues that constrained them from implementing the, the changes or, or some of the changes that they would have liked to implement as academics. And then finally, um, uh, the issue of, sorry, I just want to change my notes here. This issue of um, the challenges that the schools could not address that were not in their, um, in their scope or in their field, um, of, of influence and that spoke to internet access, poor connectivity, data challenges that you know, students express. And yes, the school is not directly responsible for addressing these challenges, but the fact that this, these issues are to be addressed at a more institutional level speaks to, you know, the, speaks to the, the systemic thinking that is needed, that the schools, the academics, the students, the whole system, and then the central system, it needs to work together as, as one ecosystem in order for the benefit, for, for students to derive benefit from it. So this was a very interesting aspect that even though the schools were not directly responsible for things like distribute, distributing data and making sure that students had working devices, their academic program is, di is directly affected by these institutional issues. So um, uh, again, in the interest of time, I'll just pause it there, but that part, I just want to highlight that point of, institutional and systemic thinking is very necessary for student success. Um, and now I will hand back to Mungen. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, at this point, I would like to discuss or rather summarize the preliminary findings of our focus groups. Um, so um, what we found was that there was little to no change um, in terms of the challenges that students raised. Um, and also uh, that can probably speak to what Sapiso has touched on, which is um, the fact that some of these things take time and uh, they are policy related, but students did express that there was little to no change to um, the challenges that they, were, that they experienced experienced. And also in terms of, uh, we also asked in terms of the value of participating in the town hall, and um, they did find that uh, it was, they found it valuable participating in the town hall. They felt that their voices were heard, um, rather they felt that they were given a, a platform to express their voices, which was very much important to them. And then, um, However, they did suggest that we give more support uh, uh, that will allow students to further participate or be more comfortable in participating in these spaces. And they, and then in, in, in that also, uh, they gave us ways in which we can encourage participation. And the one thing was to ensure um, that we put in place uh, measures that will ensure anonymity because that does influence um, whether the students are willing to participate or not. 
And then um, also we asked on the expectations after the town hall and uh, they, what they expressed express was that um, it was important for them to give their voice and for their voice to be heard. And it would be up to the schools then to uh, make sure that they implement or make those changes because it's, it, it's not up to them. So thank you so much. I'll hand over to Aneshi who will discuss uh, the further. Hey, so um, uh, good morning, everyone. I think uh, I'd just like to discuss some of the inter interesting observations that um, we made during in conducting this uh, intervention. So the first of which is that students were actually very realistic about the expectations. Um, those that participated, they used the forum and they appreciated the chance to express themselves and use their voice, um, but they really weren't expecting change within their schools immediately. Um, students were also very diplomatic in their responses. They had very keen insights, uh, not just in terms of sharing their educational and support needs, but also on the on teaching and learning practices within their schools, um, things like differentiating, as Mongeni said, between subject experts and and teachers, and paraphrasing something that came directly from a student. You know, we we know the lecturers are top people within their field; they're experts, and uh, we're not questioning their their credentials. But this doesn't mean that they're good teachers. They need training to teach effectively. Um, they also, you know wanted to be able to evaluate courses and, and for these evaluations to actually be taken seriously. And they highlighted unfair teaching and learning practices. They, they highlighted the fact that lecturers tend to see students as a homogenous group rather than teaching to a diverse range um, of needs and backgrounds. Um, and, and a lack of support. You know, this is just scratching the surface, but I think it's a real testament to the fact that students do know what they need. Um, and they're far more observant and knowledgeable than perhaps many academics actually give them credit for. Um, for us, this was a slightly difficult experience as advisors because we're here to provide support to students. You know, we're here to provide those solutions for them um, when they need it. But um, we had to hear, you know, everything that students are going through, which sometimes is very difficult because it, we're kind of in a position where we couldn't enforce change. We couldn't um, do much about it. It was up to the schools to actually make those changes. And, you know, students weren't angry. They weren't disrespectful. It was just a sense of defeat, I think, where they felt that their schools and maybe their institution, they, they didn't really care about them and the experiences and, and the fact that there was so much pressure put on them with no real care about the fact that they're human beings, you know, they're coming to university from the real world with their real problems, their real experiences, their real difficulties. And, and that just, they, they felt like that wasn't being considered, that wasn't being heard. Um, Lastly, some schools, as we've mentioned, were far more open to this process than others. I think the fierce resistance that we received from one school in particular was quite jarring. Um, and each school was a completely different experience in terms of working with them. So I think this really speaks to the need to work on the general culture within the schools uh, in terms of how student feedback is viewed. Uh, as well as valued. But one interesting observation was that even in the schools that were resistant to change, there were lecturers that started, you know, providing support for students in terms of workshops or addressing one or two things that actually came up in those town halls um, without overtly saying that, that that's what they were doing. Um, and I think that was an amazing step forward. So the question then is, where do we go from here? What is the way forward? Um, this was our first kind of foray into a project such as this, and it really highlighted the need uh, to keep doing so, to explore other avenues of amplifying student voices and using student feedback to improve this process. So whatever they told us about town halls, we need to use that and figure out you know, how to 
to better this process and how to do this in cases where perhaps the schools were not too receptive to the feedback or to the RSP as a program um, being involved in this process. So I think the last thing that I'd like to mention is that we want to encourage students to use their voice. Um, if not through this platform, then through the various other platforms that are actually available to make sure that uh, their voices are heard. And, and so we need to raise awareness around the forums and the avenues that are currently available um, for students to raise their concerns already. And um, that brings us to the end of our presentation um, and the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Uh, this was excellent. I think you raised like really critical concerns there. And thanks for validating students' concerns in the way you have. Um, are there any questions? I see Fazile has put something through on the chat. And um, yeah, basically posing the question about whether students themselves are receptive to feedback or engagement from academics while recognizing. I think that this initiative is, is so important. Fazile, do you want to talk? more to this point um thank you thank you so much and well done to the clm team it was a really really interesting um, presentation and very important work can you hear me yeah loud and clear oh great um so i think that um, the final slides that um, Anestri presented showed that there are some schools that are really receptive um, um and i guess um, really want to make sure that they they structure all their content to be relevant to students. And so my question was, um, I know that, you know, the CLM team themselves are academics. What kind of engagements have they had with students? Because I know that we're quite critical of academics, uh, but uh, are students themselves uh, receptive to yeah, feedback yeah. or open to engagement with um, academic staff? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Fazila. Um, are there any other questions? Anisha and, and team, if I may ask, you know, I, I understand that the, 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 the online sort of getting uh, academics on board, that's, that's a huge challenge. So that change management aspect must have been increasingly difficult. I just want to, to sort of ask if you could suggest or, or perhaps just share with us how that process played out. I mean, it's a very sensitive issue. Academics are burdened. Their, their workloads tenfold. Going online is, is difficult. I mean, is there, uh, is there sort of solutions as to getting more learning designers working with lecturers? How does, how does that process unfold? And, uh, you know, are, are you working with the other units, adverts? sort of been highlighting these concerns. So are schools aware of the support by perhaps CLTD and, and so forth? Just, just a question as to how those different units operate. Um, if the team is happy for me to, to take a stab at, at the question, can I, I'll start with Fezile's question and then um, I will allow others to, to add on their uh, whatever responses they, they want to add on. So, um, very briefly, students actually are open to, to feedback. Um, but what I wanted to highlight is that once students perceive that feedback to be insincere is when there is an issue. So um, I think Mungeni can actually speak more to this, is that in some of the sessions, students raise the, the issue of sometimes when you get feedback, you can see that it's a prepared response. It's actually something they were going to say. So they will give us that prepared response, even if it doesn't speak to what, what, we, issue, what we raised at the time. So the more sincere you are in your engagement, the more receptive students are um, from sure. what, what else they've seen. So just to answer your question, Fatima, um, we worked with um, the heads of schools. So we didn't just go to the academics directly. So we first approached the heads of schools to talk and spoke to them and we asked them to identify um, champions in the school that okay. you could then liaise with. So I think when you do it like that, first of all, it is their school, so you can't circumvent mm -hmm. the head of school. So up until the process of when they then identified the key academics and then sent us the names, they then told the, those academics that, um, you know, the RSP team is going to reach out to you. We want to be part of this. So I think involving the heads of schools, that helps. And then at an institutional level, I mean, we sit on many meetings, FYE, teaching and learning, we raise these issues um, constantly. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. 
Thanks, Alicia. Any other questions from um, the okay. group? I did just want to add to Tepiso's response. I think that covered everything, but also um, the CLTD is quite visible, I think. So the offerings are, are known or should be known. As academics, we get uh, updates from the CLTD on, on courses on teaching, how to assess, how to effectively evaluate. So that that is available and um, awareness is raised quite frequently. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, are there any other questions? I see we're about to start with the next paper then. So I'm going to hand over to Arshad Mariki Razia in Janus. All familiar faces, I think. Hi, Razia. Nice to see you Hi. again. <laughs> okay, then. Over to your team. Thank you, Fatima. Um, I'm Razia Musa, and my colleagues Arshad Mula and Marika Tlaits will be presenting on digital abilities and academic integrity as keys to unlocking the gateway to success. Arshad is just putting up the presentation for us. So we will begin by contextualizing the gateway to success program and then present the digital literacy and academic integrity courses. We will then conclude with reflections and the way forward. Um, the gap between first year and grade 12 has always been quite pronounced. But with the move to emergency remote teaching due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this gap became even more pronounced. At WITS, we wanted to develop an exclusive support program to help students bridge the gap. As a result, the Gateway to Success was conceptualized. It was a three week long program conducted from the 7th to the 25th of February this year and was compulsory for all new first year students with no extra tuition fees. It was a university-wide initiative for 7,200 first-year students in all of our faculties. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the Gateway to Success program was designed, Rashad, you can go on back, please. The Gateway to Success program was designed as an integrated, coordinated, and scheduled program with academic, personal development, and student life components, and a mix of online and on-campus uh, on activities. Um, as you can see, there were five components, an academic component, an orientation component, a student life and mentoring component, and an academic support component. In our presentation today, we will focus on the academic support component, which consisted of digital abilities and academic integrity as two keys to unlocking the gateway to success. In terms of the time allocation, we allocated 20 hours to digital abilities and five hours to academic integrity. Arshad will now present the digital abilities course. Thank you, Arshad. Uh, thank you to everyone in attendance today for this uh, opportunity to speak to you. Um, so uh, as uh, Razia mentioned, just moving to the next slide. Okay. Um, so as Razia mentioned, um, the digital abilities was a three week, 20 hour long course developed for um, first years as part of the Gateway to Success program, which took place from 7 to 24 February. Um, the purpose of this course was twofold. Firstly, it provided students with uh, fundamental knowledge and skills relating to the fun foundational concepts uh, relating to both digital literacy and digital skills. Um, secondly, um, it equips students with an understanding of the importance of um, the importance of having these skills in the 21st century, regardless of the degree that they are studying and their career aspirations. Uh, we aim to change the attitude of students so that they can further their digital abilities even after they completed this course. And we aim to drop the seed about changing their attitude throughout the course. Um, it was made up of the following seven modules. Um, learning how to use Canvas, which uh, at FITS we call Uluazi. Um, we had initial courses, which I will speak to in a bit. 
um, working with computers and devices, information literacy, Microsoft uh, Office 365, communication tools, and um, evaluating courses. Um, so with these modules, the course provided uh, students with the opportunity to practice using technology to access, manage, and manipulate uh, info and create information. And they were shown how to work with computers, including the hardware and software components, and gain exposure to different learning technologies most commonly used at uh, Fitz University, such as uh, Microsoft Teams, Big Blue Button, uh, Turnitin, uh, Google, Sli Google Slides, Google Docs, as well as the university's learning management system. Um, the course also focused on one session on information literacy, uh, using Google to search for information, and one session on evaluating the trustworthiness of information. And it aimed to give students the digital uh, skills necessary to engage in online learning, as well as to develop their confidence in using many of the digital tools and to also explore the content and possibilities that are available to them online. So um, this course was uh, structured using a deep and meaningful learning framework, and it focused on providing students with opportunities to practice using um, these tools to become confident and confident in using the technology mix at uh, efforts. Um, so the deep and meaningful learning framework framework is made up of six components, which are shown on the right. Um, it includes providing constructive feedback, reflection, self-directed learning, using authentic assessments, collaborative learning, and um, real-world learning. Um, so this is, uh, I should note that this is a novel framework that uh, has been used extensively already at the Department of Family Medicine. And our colleague, Johannes van Us and others are in the process of publishing a, a book chapter on it, which goes much detail and unpacks it in uh, much further. So um, anyway, the deep and meaningful learning uh, framework is a student-centered active learning approach focused on developing 21st century skills while providing students with real-world learning um, that produces long-lasting, meaningful change in the way they think, feel um, in relation to their attitudes and values and in terms of what they do is in their skills. Um, so the first university uses the Canvas um, learning management system, which allows us to use a feature called Mastery Parts. And this is uh, similar to adaptive testing, which helped with the self-directedness of the course. Um, so um, although uh, we aim to incorporate um, all six of the deep and meaningful learning components, due to the time limit of today's presentation, we will only be able to share a few examples of how they were used. Um, the first component is self-directed learning. And so, uh, since this was a fully asynchronous course, um, I should mention that uh, we, we did have tutors in our computer labs, which students could make a booking with if they have never used a computer before or if they needed more help. Um, we've also made use of adaptive testing um, in the second module which consisted of tests based on the upcoming modules uh, and the results students achieved in those uh, uh, initial tests uh, determined whether they take a beginner or advanced level of sessions within those modules. Uh, we also created a video on student, how students can navigate the course and we also made use of the same, of the same template uh, within each session to help students uh, navigate the course much easier. And a few things that this template consisted of was um, the, it included the purpose of the session, the learning outcomes, and the time allocation. And this helped with 
uh, the self-directedness and they were better able to situate themselves in relation to the content. Um, the next component is collaborative learning. And there is a spark question that uh, kicks off each uh, session by asking students to think about the uh, um, concept related to the session. Uh, students answered this question in a comment section and they were able to see their peers' responses as well as uh, reply to them. Um, this was common in all of the sessions during the course and it helped to create a collaborative learning environment. Um, I will tell you more about the Spark question in the next slide. Um, we also made extensive use of discussions and tried to make it interesting and engaging. We also had a number of try-it-yourself activities and some of them required students to peer review each other's work. Um, so the example on the right is from an activity where students were required to use their Google search skills to find an article on the importance of having digital skills in their field of study and then share it in a discussion. And then in the next session, they were introduced to the drop test, which is used to evaluate the trustworthiness of information. And then they were asked to go back to the discussion and evaluate one person's article and give them a score out of 50. Uh, which was a uh, TN for currency, relevancy, authority, accuracy, and purpose, and then provide um, reasons for providing a score. And we also uh, made netiquette rules clear in the course. Um, so moving on to real world learning and reflection, um, the Spark question that I mentioned previously um, aim to make students think about how they can apply uh, the skills that they were about to learn in the real world, um, particularly in their uh, chosen profession. And on the left is an example of one of the spark questions. Um, we also included a checklist uh, at the end of each uh, session, which is which was aligned to the learning outcomes, so students could reflect on. Uh, what they have uh, learned at the end of the session. And we also had an additional reflective question at the end of uh, each session, and here is an example of one. Um, so at the end of the course, we directed students to a Blue Explorance uh, course evaluation before showing them a video on how to use the platform. Um, we, we received 2,000 217 responses, and there were a variety of questions um, in the evaluation, but a generous 84% of them um, said that they were satisfied with the course. Um, in addition, we asked students to rate whether or not they felt they achieved the following um, uh, outcomes which were aligned with the overall cause of uh, learning outcomes. And um, so 84.39% um, said that they were able to navigate um, the, the, uh, the learning management system, which we use. 71.9% um, uh, of them said that they were able to work with computers and devices, including the hardware and software components. Um, uh, this included using, a, being able to switch on and off a computer, um, as well as using a mouse and keyboard to type uh, efficiently and to, and to improve their uh, typing skills, as well as make use of, uh, of uh, Windows and the different apps. Um, also, 67.79% uh, said that they were able to use tools for communication in a digital environment. Um, this included using email accounts such as Gmail, uh, which uh, is their student email account, and also shown different types of email providers and how to create accounts with them. Um, and also 64.91% uh, 
one percent said that they were able to access manage manipulate and create information using the most popular applications which mostly consisted of the microsoft office uh, 365 apps such as uh, word powerpoint and excel um so now i will move on to uh, marika who will talk to you about the uh, academic integrity course thank you Thank you so much, Arshad. Um, so the tension between academic integrity and academic misconduct has always been around. So with the advent of computers, copy-paste plagiarism became a big deal for us at universities. But even before that, very, very long before that, Socrates complained about the emergence of writing as producing students who appear to know things that they actually do not know. So I'm not going to go toe to toe with Socrates right now. I actually think writing is a great way to learn. Um, but um, I just want to show us that there's different ways of looking at integrity and problems with that. So the tension between academic integrity and academic misconduct has heightened with emergency remote teaching. Students were isolated at home and used Google and other sites as uh, tutors to fill a vacuum that was unfortunately left online. Some of these behaviors would be classed as academic misconduct, but students may have made use of this really just as a coping mechanism and not for any other types of nefarious reasons. So the purpose of this course was to serve a first, as a first introduction to the concepts of academic misconduct integrity and misconduct as a starting point to address some of the new forms of academic misconduct that we became aware of. So the school started out with academic integrity, unpacking the six pillars on which this concept is based, which you see on the screen right now. We focused strongly on honesty as the starting point. And because we agree with Sobkak's philosophy that in integrity cannot happen within a vacuum, and can only be understood um, as a concept um, within a community, we try to build that concept of community into our courses. So even though this was a completely online course, we strongly foregrounded discussion, critical analysis, and asking questions. So uh, let's just move on to the next slide. Thanks, Ashad. Um, in the academic integrity course, uh, the most prominent aspects of deep and meaningful learning design was self-directed learning, authentic assessment, and real-world learning and collaborative. For self-directed learning, students had to find resources on topics such as how to reference um, on the internet. They had to vet these resources and then share them and reference them um, in an open Google Docs file. They also had to answer spark questions at the beginning of each section that requires them to start grappling with issues linked to the module. So even though no formal assessments were linked to the academic integrity course, authentic assessment was still in place as students needed to grapple with real world scenarios. They needed to analyze these scenarios, reflect on them, organize their thoughts, and then, of course, provide responses. And this was mostly housed in the games and scenarios that we created. So the scenarios were modeled on specific real world examples of misconduct that we have found in the institution in the previous few years. And then the academic integrity and in space game, which is an open educational resource, um, dealt with more general real world, ex real world examples. And this was developed by Ryerson University. Um, we'll pop the link to that for you into the chat so that you can go have a look at it later. So um, with collaborative learning, um, we embedded that through the use of discussion forums where students needed to answer very specific questions, like for instance, um, what types of academic misconduct are you aware of? And then students were encouraged to interact with each other and kind of challenge each other's thoughts, of course. So collaborative learning was um, also present where students had to share resources on platforms such as Google Docs, as mentioned earlier, but also Padlet and Miro. And all of these um, resources were embedded in the LMS so students have, didn't have to pop out of the environment and come back in. So the impact of the learning design can be seen in student feedback about what they've learned. 
Students had to evaluate whether they felt they understood certain knowledge domains, as well as which skills they felt they could do after completion of the course. Uh, we can move on our shot. So then the question is, what can we learn from this? Um, from our own design, as our shard has mentioned, uh, with deep and meaningful learning and with those circles on, um, on, on the screen, there's quite a lot of aspects to um, this design. So in our design for our two current courses, uh, reflection practices were present, uh, with students having to reflect at the end of each module about the learning they have completed. Um, but this aspect of deep and meaningful learning can be strengthened in future iterations of both of these courses. Um, we've also found that providing constructive feedback is another aspect of design that needs to be strengthened in future. So no tutors were assigned to either one of these two courses and thus the content developers of these courses try to provide overarching feedback, but as Razia mentioned at the beginning, we had just over, or just under 7,200 uh, uh, first year students at the university. So for a team of two or three people, that was to provide intense feedback was not um, possible. So we just, just did this in a very general and overarching way. So moving forward, we think it is necessary to partner with other structures within the Gateway to Success program to make use of mentors or writing fellows, which are already part of the program, to help build communities of integrity, but also to help support each other in aspects of digital abilities. So another important aspect in building um, uh, these feedback loops is creating stronger peer collaboration and feedback structures in both of these courses. So uh, next slide, please, Asha. Thank you. And uh, then within these two courses, the design contributed to high participation rates. Even though teacher and tutor presence were minimal, um, we could see in the academic integrity course, uh, if we just boil down that 7,200 students to 10 students, um, as just a representative, nine out of 10 students um, uh, participated in that course. So they were there, students participated, even though we weren't um, as present as we would have liked to be. Um, so students freely engaged with each other, sharing thoughts and ideas and questioning each other's perspectives. This, um, as well as resource sharing, led to community building, as well as developing competencies and skills that would help them with university success. So we've learned that self-directed learning can be a powerful tool to keep students engaged. And then just design-wise, we saw how important proper scaffolding is, starting with a spark question and ending with a reflection on what was learned and accomplished in each module, Within the scaffolding, we could confront students with difficult scenarios and questions in, it, in which it was ideal for them to reach out to their peers and in this way develop communities. Uh, the design also allowed for learning pathways to ensure that no student was left behind or felt bored by doing things that they have um, already encountered or mastered. And that kind of brings us to our last slide. Thank you, Ashad. Um, so deep and me meaningful learning provides a holistic approach to design. In the learning aspect of the module, it is crucial to provide students with opportunities and time to think and to do, which is housed in the concepts of real world learning, collaborative learning and authentic assessment. Something we did not focus on strongly today is the administration of the courses, which also plays an important role. Courses must be easy to navigate with a clear beginning, middle and end, with clear instructions on how to progress through the work. And within these courses, you also need to develop strong communication lines, which we did through inboxes, announcements, discussion forums, and using um, Yammer as a platform also embedded in the LMS. At course level, support was provided to students with regard to IT and directing, stu directing students to support services and faculties within the broader um, university um, environment uh, as those issues came up. But if we take a step back, um, what, we are do what we are focusing on today, these two courses, on a program level, 
um, looks at support because they are the support courses for the um, Gateway to Success program. So they provided academic and IT support on a program level to students. So to implement this approach um, might feel very daunting and big, but it's actually not. Um, you can incorporate aspects of the learning design uh, and, and, and it can be approached in phases saying, I'm going to focus on reflection or I'm going to focus on authentic assessment. And then just lastly, this design is not a once off thing. It is an iterative process um, with the student at the center. As Washart mentioned, this has been used in, the, uh, in family medicine quite extensively. And um, what usually happens, it hasn't happened for these two courses yet, but it will, is that the next step is SWOT analyses and um, strong structures with students using student curriculum review teams to analyze these courses and then to rework and re reposition them accordingly. And um, so that's it from our side. Thank you very much for your time and listening to us. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them. Thank you. Thanks, Mariki, Arshad, and Razia. Um, there's a comment on the chat from Ku. Ku, uh, would you like to ask that or should I just read this? Ku just asked if you assess students' digital aptitudes prior to the intervention? Um, Arshad, I think um, you are better positioned to answer this question, so I'm going to hand over to you. Um, so we, we did have a module um, on the technology landscape, um, and it was a discussion. And we did ask uh, questions similar to um, assessing their attitudes. And we asked them a question like, why, why do they think it's important for them to have these digital um, skills and digital uh, literacy, um, especially in relation to the um, de degree and profession and career aspirations? So yeah, that was um, in module module one. Uh, module zero was actually learning how to use the, the, the learning management system. Okay. Um, cool. Do you want to ask anything else? Anyone? Um, if I could ask uh, the notion of Authentic assessments, it's, it's novel, it's, it's new, well, not novel. I mean, that, that would be in line with appropriate learning design. Uh, just, I'm just wondering what the uptake was and whether WITS is also considering something like cooperative examinations, just sort of alternative assessments and to what degree that uptake is uh, currently at. Because yeah, it does, does employ uh, quite a bit of considered thought and creativity around designing those type of assessments. Mariki, I know medical school obviously is sort of always years ahead of that, that approach. Yeah, uh, thank you Fatima. So um, yeah, so as you know, with VETS, we all work in faculties and uh, we're always in, which there is a big discussion about authentic assessment. Um, my, one of my colleagues, Kershri Pariachi, is very um, uh, engaged in that, and that is, that is something that is um, very um, strongly um, trying to, to push that and pull it through courses um, uh, at an institutional level, but um, being uh, in a VET session, I, I, I think um, colleagues like from CLM and Humanities is also presenting in the session could say also how that has come through in their faculties, um, because I can only speak to my faculty at this point. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Mariki. Sure. Um, any other questions, Bob? Okay, so then off to Dani de Klerk, also from BITS, and also speaking about academic advising, giving voice to academic advisors, insights into student support needs from Wits University. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Fatima. Let me just get this going. I don't work in Zoom that often. Just tell me when you can see that in presenter mode. Is that okay? That's fine. 
Thank Great. You. Thanks. Thanks, Fatima. It's really nice to see you again. And thanks to the colleagues who have gone before me for, for two very interesting presentations, and I'm looking forward to the one coming here after. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Dani, as Fatima has said. Um, I'm the Assistant Dean for Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Commerce Law and Management at WITS. Um, and I'm also head of our Teaching and Learning Center. And the first presentation, which I thought was excellent, is from a team in the center. And I just want to congratulate them here, too, for a really um, well presented and well thought through study. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about academic advising. And um, I think it's common knowledge, and at least in the Siapu Malela network, that academic advising is now becoming more established in South Africa. Um, and I thought, let's just have a quick, quick overview of, of where we are at the moment. So globally, um, academic advising is well established, both in the global north and in Australia. And decades of work inform um, the work, the, the academic advising in the United States. Um, so they've got NACADA, which is their professional body of academic advisors. They have an annual conference, they have a journal, and um, there's a wealth of literature about ad advising and how it's practiced in that country. Um, some may ask why academic advising, and I think Sir puts it best or, or, or highlights it in the best way when he says it's a high impact practice um, and that advising has the potential to enhance the student learning experience, the holistic student experience and student success. And other scholars from South Africa has, um, has, has found similar, similar things. And we we'll look at the work done by the UFS, for example. But now, while we can learn a great deal from our colleagues in the Global North, um, my argument is with this study and, and my other um, academic advising related research, as well as the way we practice it, is that we need evidence informed contributions about advising in and for South African higher education. As I've said, this is a new, others have said this before. Um, the ad academic advisors who presented earlier, we've uh, presented collab collaboratively on that dimension as well. But then let's look a little bit at what's happening in South Africa. So while advising remains an emerging profession and a practice within the South African higher education, quite a bit has been happening over the last five or so years, and it's quite exciting. So I think one of the most prominent things is the Siapu Malela work stream. Um, and I think the first meeting was in 2017, but that really started to, um, to, to lend the this, this snowball gravitas to, to academic advising where it's, things started to happen. And from there, we've seen um, uh, presentations and work about advising coming through at these conferences and in other spaces. Um, ELETSA is the national body for academic advisors, and, I, and our colleague Gugu from, um, from the UFS, I believe, um, is kind of heading that up. Um, there is the formalized training for South African advisors offered by the UFS. And there's also been a contribution in terms of literature about academic advising in our country that's come through. Um, and before 2020, um, here and there, little bits, often related to, to high-risk students or students at risk, et cetera. But then quite excitedly, uh, last year, there was a special issue of the, so that, of the Journal of Student Affairs in Africa dedicated to academic advising. Um, and and quite, a, quite a, a lot is being contributed through those spaces. But although I'm saying quite a lot, I do believe that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, so my argument is that as academic advising for South, Africa, for South Africa grows, we must shift towards developing global South theories and practices that are responsive to the South African higher education context, because our context is unique. And although there are certainly similarities between us and the United States, as we've seen through the Siapu Malela and Dream Networks over many years, there are those things that are unique to our country. So this premise, this whole idea, not only underpins the study on the paper I'm talking about here today, but also the larger study from which this, this paper emanates. Um, and more generally, like I said earlier, the way that we at least practice academic advising um, in CLN. So then at WITS itself, um, advising has been around since about 2015, but initially it wasn't called academic advising. Um, I, came, I came in as an academic advisor late in 2014, and at the time, we called ourselves at-risk coordinators, or that was the term that was used. And um, 
I think in hindsight, it sounds terrible to talk of, of someone as an at-risk coordinator. And I think there are colleagues in the room who themselves came in as at-risk coordinators. But with the national shift, our, invo our, our involvement in Sierra Malela and in DREAM, um, this changed. And we now call it academic advising at FITS. Um, this, the, the institution uses a decentralized model of advising um, with advisors residing in each of the five faculties. Um, the, all the advisors have a community of practice and Razio is in the room, coordinates that for, for, um, for VITS. And, at, and that, that community of practice meets about quarterly and they're able to then share best practice and, and work together in that forum. But each faculty also um, has the independence to, to practice and implement academic advising in the way that they see fit. And so there are some nuances, but then they also try and work together when they can. So at the time the data was collected for this study, and I'll talk a little bit more about the study itself um, in a while, um, there were roughly 15 academic advisors working across the five faculties at WITS. And about 70% of the advisors are currently um, on the academic track. So they're appointed as academics. Um, and then the others are appointed as professional or support staff. And some of them have the option of converting to the academic track once they've completed a PhD. But if we look at the, at the information about how academics are appointed, it usually depends on the faculty. And in our faculty in CLM, and I think we, it did come up earlier during their presentation, Fazile asked the question, all four of the academic advisors are appointed on the academic track. And that is quite intentional because firstly, we believe um, that being academics gives them clout with academics. Um, the, 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 the intervention or the initiative they, they presented on earlier would arguably have been, could have been um, a little more challenging had they been professional and administrative staff. And I think that's this whole separate conversation that we can have about why that happens. But the other reason why they're appointed as academics is because that enables them um, through the way in which they're appointed to then also contribute to the scholarship of student success more broadly and academic advising in particular. And again, we saw their presentation, which is, which is wonderful. So then a little bit about the study. Um, so this, this paper and the study emanates from my PhD research. Um, and when I started with the PhD, it was prior to COVID-19. And as I continued with this PhD, I started to realize that I have a lot of data. The study has a quantitative baseline data set and that is a quantitative data set that I developed when I was still working as an academic advisor um, over a three year period. And then it also consists of the data that informs the study, which is interview data with the 15 academic advisors. So the data is extremely rich and you'll see that I'm only focusing on one question from the interviews and it's because the data is so rich. So the rationale for the study, um, it is to see to, to clarify student support needs from the perspective of practicing academic advisors, um, to, to try and highlight factors that are likely to affect student success, and to foreground possible areas of professional development for academic advisors working in South Africa um, as we continue to grow academic advising. In terms of uh, methodology, it's a phenomenological study, and it aims to make meaning of academic advising as the phenomenon being studied, the emphasis on the collective experiences of practicing academic advisors who provide insight into the most common reasons why students seek advice. And these insights are useful to help understand the scope and complexity of the work of South African advisors, um, but also potentially could help inform the way that we enhance student success. And you'll see what I mean when I talk about the scope and complexity of their work um, when, I, when I present the findings. So in terms of data, um, a purpose of sampling um, approach were, were, was adopted. I, I interviewed the 15 academic advisors available. Um, Semi-structured interviews were conducted and the interviews consisted of three parts. So I first had all the, the, the participating um, academic advisors do a free writing exercise. Thereafter, I asked questions about academic advising prior to COVID-19 and the pandemic. And then I asked questions about academic advising during the COVID-19 pandemic and ERTL. And so maybe just some additional information. These interviews were conduct conducted in November 2020. So it was um, towards the end of that year. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and it was important for me to 
distinguish in, in asking these questions um, the, the, the ERTL work from the non-ERTL work. Um, on the one hand, because that's the way that the study had initially been designed, and obviously I had to adapt it um, when, when, when ERTL came. But I also felt that there would be a need to, to at some point maybe have something to compare. So the interviews were semi-structured, open-ended, um, that allowed um, the, the respondents to, to have a little bit of freedom in their responses. It also allowed me to probe when I, when I needed to. They were all conducted virtually. Um, and recorded and transcribed. And then, as I said, the data generated from the interviews is exceptionally rich. And that's why um, this paper only focuses on one question from part two of the interviews. I have paper, I've published two other papers um, that look at various aspects of, of the, the larger study, one on the quantitative data set, one on the ERTL related academic advising or advisor matters. There are two more papers currently um, in for review. And so this is actually a fifth paper um, that I'm working on right now. And you'll see at the end, I'm also asking for some input from your side. Um, I'm going to make you work, but hopefully not too much. Um, and so, as I said, the, the responses to, to the question or what we're going to look at today is based on academic advisor, advisors applying their minds to the way that advising was practiced prior to ERTL. So the question I asked them, or the question we're looking at today is what would you say are the five most common things students seek advice about? And so I wanna say that the question presumes that students seek advice. And I was comfortable to make that assumption uh, based on my own work as an academic advisor between 2014 and 2019. Before we look at the data, I want to encourage um, everyone in the room to look past the kind of, oh, I knew that would be the response, because some of these things are, you'll say, you'll say, no, but we knew that. And I want you to adopt the lens of what does all of this mean for the way we practice advising in South Africa and for student success? Um, and then I just want to say that the findings are presented in no particular order. So I haven't done any clustering yet, that's deliberate, but I'll discuss that briefly towards the end. So then let's look at the findings. The first thing that emerged was time management. Um, 10 of the advisors identified time management as something students seek advice about, and many of them identified this as the most common thing or said it was among the most common things. So interviewee one says the major one is time management, and interviewee six says the top of the list, time management, and that underpins all these others which comes through, and we'll talk about that towards the end, that link to other things. Um, interview 11 said time management, that's the top thing, and interviewee 13 said the first one would be time management. They normally don't know that they're actually asking for help with time management. And that's also important. And I'll pick up on that again a little later as well. The next one was anxiety. Um, I think before looking at the, at the, at the quotes, um, for me, it's important to acknowledge the fact that students are willing to speak to advisors about their anxieties. And obviously, there is, there's a lot to be probed there, um, but we assume in the way that advising is generally conceptualized that an academ academic advisor becomes this point of contact, this node um, for students so that they have someone within the institution that they have a relationship with. And I think um, it, is, it is not far reaching to say that expressing one's anxieties to someone else, especially um, a person who's not a family member or a friend is not always easy. And, I, and that's why I'm saying it's, it is significant. So interview one said, I'd get a lot of students that say to me, I'm struggling with anxiety. And interview eight, there are students who come in with anxiety as a result of that academic workload. So this, the, the interview eight identifies that workload as potentially leading to anxiety. And then interview 14 said, generalized anxiety, and that anxiety can be related to anything. It could be an interpersonal struggle. It could be something that happened on the morning that they come to see me. It could be issues related to lack of confidence interacting with academia. So the reasons, according to interview 14, is quite broad for why they may come and present with anxiety. Then I'm moving on to the next one, funding and bursaries. Again, um, not a surprise uh, if we think about the, the challenges in our country around funding. Nearly all of the academic advisors I interviewed mentioned that financial challenges, funding, and or bursary applications was one of the most common things that students seek advice about. And although not mentioned here, things like NISFAS, et cetera, also came in. So interviewee one said, 
I need assistance with applying for a bursary, three, financial issues. Um, interviewee 10 said, support in terms of applications for bursaries. They want me to write a reference letter. And so this also came through from one or two of the advisors is that students may come to the advisor and ask them for a reference letter when they're applying for a bursary or scholarship. And again, I think that speaks to the relationship between the student and the academic advisor, because we tend not to go to just anyone when we ask for a reference letter. We go to someone that we trust. We go to someone that we know knows us. And that's also an, um, an important point to note. And then interview 14 says, students who are feeling insecure and who are struggling because they don't have financial resources. And so here the link is being made to how not having financial resources affects the student. And I'll get to, um, to, to something, to emotional and, and personal challenges in a minute. Then another one that emerged was accommodation. Again, not surprising. Um, this is tied to funding inevitably, um, but can also be tied to some other matters. And some of the advisors made this explicit. So fund, uh, accommodation can be tied to funding issues, funding issues and accommodation issues can be tied to anxieties, et cetera. So interview one said, um, in, in response to the question about what, is the, what are the five most common things students seek advice about, they said, assist students with accommodation. A lot of students do not have accommodation. And then interviewee two said, it goes hand in hand with accommodation. They are also sleeping in the labs. And so this to me, again, just speaks to the nature of academic advising, the, the complexity, the breadth of things that academic advisors have to be able to, to deal with almost on a daily basis in South Africa. And brings me back to the earlier point about the nuances of academic advising as we practice it in this country. Interviewee seven said accommodation, students don't have a place to stay. Then they come to us and they say, I need a place to stay. And I think back to my own time as an academic advisor, those scenarios are difficult because, and I think one of the others, I think it was in the first presentation spoke about, students come to an academic advisor for support, for help, hoping to find solutions to problems, but academic advisors can't always provide the solutions. However, they need to maintain the relationship because they want the student to come back. They want to close that advising loop and make sure that they continue to have a, a relationship with the student. And then interview eight said, accommodation is some, sometimes a problem, but it's usually related to finance. So making the link between accommodation and finance. Another one is administrative matters. Um, things like extensions for assessment submissions. Um, interview eight said the issue of procedures, particularly in terms of missing assessments when someone is ill. So there's a whole lot of the, those administrative procedures that students might not be aware of that they also come for advice on. So coming to an academic advisor, advisor to ask about those procedural matters. And then interview 12 said, I deal with a lot of administrative queries, stuff like, you know, um, my LMS is not working or this course is not reflecting. Then moving on to food security, and again, I, I know I said earlier I didn't cluster, that was deliberate. I mean, I could have clustered finances and I could, uh, accommodation, et cetera, together, but I, I just kind of engaged with the, with the interviews and, and extracted these as they came through. So food security, not a surprise. I mean, BUT had presented on their food garden, um, and we know that a lot of work is being done in this regard, but that doesn't change the fact that our students are hungry. So interview two identified food security as a common um, thing students seek advice about. Interview five said food security is also a big problem. Interview six, social is one of those things. I don't have food, speaking kind of from the student's perspective. Interview seven, students come and say I don't have food. And interview 14, they want advice in terms of how they can source food. And again, it brings me back to the complexity of the work of academic advisors. Because what do you do if you cannot give the student food? You can refer them to a food bank, I mean, or a, a, a food garden, because most institutions have those. But we know that that is also not as simple. Um, it's not simply go there and you'll get food. There are processes, et cetera. And all of these things impact on the way that, that students um, study and their learning experience, but also on the work of academic advisors. The next one is um, careers guidance. And I'm, gonna, and I'm coupling this with the one that comes here after, which is curriculum advising. Um, I should mention here that this is not professional career guidance, but rather a discussion about possible careers in relation to a degree of choice. Professional career guidance is done through our, our career guidance office, um, you know, at the, at the central um, counseling unit. 
So in degree four and, and three and four identify um, advice about career careers or career trajectory as, as things that come up. In degree 12 said one would be a, one would be career planning, so what to do with their degrees. And in degree 15 said career and stuff. Um, and then, like, as I said, this links to curriculum advising, um, where students come to ask advice about their curriculum, about courses, about degree fit and changes. Um, so we see that interview four say they seek advice about what subjects they must do. And interview five said students come to the university and they are doing a specific degree because their family thinks it will give them the best job. They don't want to necessarily do that. They're not necessarily passionate about that. And so this issue of degree fit, but also how it links to personal challenges or relationship challenges with a family, et cetera, comes in. And the advisor is the one who needs to engage with that. Then interview nine, nine said, sometimes it's about curriculum change. And interview 10 said, curriculum advising, wanting to change courses, it's degree fit and subject choice. So again, the, the, the idea of curriculum advising, degree fit and career guidance all clustered together. Um, the next one, and I promise this is the third last one, is personal and emotional matters. So there are quite a few observations from the academic advisors that fall into this broad category of personal and emotional matters. Um, the advisors observe um, that students aren't fitting in, that they're not knowing who to approach for help, that they, um, that they don't know how to deal with personal challenges, like with family issues or relationships. And they come to the advisors to express this. And again, it speaks to my earlier thing about the relationship between um, the advisor and the student and the fact that the student feels comfortable to speak to the advisor about it. So interview two says student well-being, their emotional well-being and their personal issues is something that comes up regularly. Interview seven says they need help on like emotional issues, like they're not coping, they're overwhelmed, they're frustrated, they're confused. And then interview 11 says students struggle with personal issues. It could be relationship issues or family issues. And the last, literally they're looking for a human connection. Some people just, the fact that someone knows their name and someone actually cares, it helps. And so this highlights some of the isolation that our students experience and how the academic advisors are um, at the receiving end of that. Then second last one is study skills. Again, probably not a surprise. Quite a few advisors observed a connection between time management and study skills. And some also tied both of these to students presenting with feelings of anxiety. And so you can see all four of the, the advisors there, I'm not going to read through them all, spoke about study methods, study skills, how to study, um, and stu students taking time to understand how to study at university. And then the last one, um, I've just called other, because there were four that, that don't really fit into the other categories. Interview four said, as advisors, our role then become very vital because the students sometimes just don't know who to talk to. So speaking to why academic advisors are so crucial. Interview seven said, lecture indifference. Lecturers are not helpful. They, um, lecturers that are not helpful, that are not sympathetic. And so this is something that this advisor struggled with, this idea of students not being able to go to their lecturers and find the, need they, the, the, the help they need there. Um, interview 10 said, mental health. Then I put them in touch with my colleagues um, or someone from CCDU. So again, um, referring students to uh, spaces where, where uh, professional um, uh, psych uh, psych uh, psych psychological help can be, can be sought. And then the last one, interview 11, said self-comparison with other students. Students start with self-doubt, and usually it comes from the fact that they're comparing themselves with someone else. And, I, and this is something that interests me, and I think that needs more kind of investigation, this idea of com comparison and maybe um, kind of imposterism or imposter phenomenon, et cetera. Okay, so I know I'm running out of time. So let's have a quick um, look at a few observations. So these are just observations I've made. So it seems that challenges are sel seldom stand alone and academic advisors view them as interconnected. So uh, for example, funding and accommodation are usually related and challenges of this nature can lead to anxiety or academic performance issues. Um, academic advisors at WITS are required to know about a broad range of matters. And I said I, 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 didn't I didn't cluster earlier, but I think one can cluster them into excellent skills, curriculum advising, psychosocial matters, socioeconomic matters, student well-being, and administration. Oopsie, sorry. Um, and then um, 
The next observation, academic advisors draw on their experience and skills to identify student needs, even when students may not know what they're actually struggling with. So they are diagnosing. Um, a student may come in and say, I need help with X, but the academic advisor engages with them and then identify, but you also need y, help with Y and Z. Um, second last, we must not discount the power of networking and referral as part of the effective advising strategy. Because advisors, although they know about a broad range of things, they can't always help with everything. That network of support is absolutely essential. And then last, academic advisors have a unique view of the student experience that goes beyond statistics and figures to the real deep insight into the lived realities of students. And I'm just wondering, are we missing out on an opportunity to harness this to the benefit of student success? So then we come to questions and I've got questions for you and I'm going to put up the Padlet in a second and I'd love, love for you to just go in there and maybe even into the next session, just think about these things. So my questions are, how do these findings compare to what others are seeing at the institutions? Um, what does this mean for how we approach academic advisor professional development in South Africa? And lastly, what, I'm, I'm curious to know about what theories or frameworks or models others would use to interrogate the data that I shared here today. And so I'm just going to put that up if you want to, um, if you want to just use the, the QR code or else I'll post the link to the Padlet in the chat. And I'd really appreciate if you could go and just share your thoughts there. It's absolutely anonymous um, and voluntary. And that's it. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks, Zani. That was really, really interesting. And you're so fortunate that you can implement your findings from your PhD into the actual work you're doing. Um, really great that you're sensitizing us to all the challenges faced by students and yeah, the way forward there. There's, Nicola is asked a question there with regards to the advisors that you refer to in your study. They're all from the same university or was it across the sector? Thanks, Nicola. Um, so all the advisors that I interviewed are from Wits University, so from one university, and you're absolutely right. I think it would be fascinating and, and, and very useful to have, have some kind of a larger nationwide or sector-wide insights into the experiences of academic, adv uh, academic advisors. Okay. Any other questions, colleagues? Uh, Danny, have you placed the link in the chat? The link is in the chat. So anyone who wants I'm to go and to oh, sorry, you. sorry, no, I've pasted it. Um, let me just repaste it. There we go. There we go. That should do the trick. Can you see it? Uh, Jenny's got her hand up. Jenny. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, Danny. I, hi, I just wondered hi, how you doing? So nice well, to see you, you after yeah. all this you work. You too. You too. Um, <laughs> I was wondering about other people who are easily accessible to students. So, for example, earlier today, um, UKZN spoke about every single student having a mentor as they join the university. Um, is that something that, that actually happens? I mean, it, it sounds as if you are often, because you have this relationship, students come to you. And I have to say, having been in bridging like 30 years ago, um, that was part of the role that we played. We were the one group of people that students knew. And so we dealt with everything. But I was just hoping that the universities had established, um, you know, other points of contact for mm. students. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jenny. And absolutely. So um, I'll talk about two things. So in our faculty, um, we have the four academic advisors, but we also appoint uh, between 12 and 15 peer advisors annually. Um, from the senior undergraduate student mm. group in the faculty. Um, it has become quite sought after we, re the, well, we, that advisors receive about 50 or 60 applications, then go through a shortlisting and an interview process. And they use the peer advisors in the faculty to, to kind of support the work that they do, um, a referral network, et cetera. But within the institution at WITS, we also have what they call the first year experience or FYE mentors. And the premise there is that um, our development and leadership unit annually towards the end of a year would um, identify about, I don't want to lie to you, but I think it's about 500 to 800 students from across the institution, from the various faculties. Um, and they would then interview them and select FYE mentors. They go through training. 
And then the idea is that the Gateway to Success program that Razia and, and her colleagues presented on, during that time, students are connected to their FYE mentors. So about seven to nine students per mentor. Um, and it's, it's, their mentor sits within the faculty. And that mentorship program is ran or coordinated in at least in our faculty by the academic advisors. So just trying to make those connections and make use of the various support networks. And then, like I said as well, this idea of having a relationship with the entire community is essential because that referral structure is, is, is we can't work essential. without it, right? Yeah. Um, and I think one thing that, that, I, that, I'm, that always, I think it'll always be an issue it's just closing that loop. I think that's something that I that I find when and it's happening, but it's happening anecdotally. And I think we need to shift in terms of how that happens more intentionally. Exactly. Sorry, I'll stop now, Fatima. <laughs> oh, one, I think one question, but you might have answered that. You had, uh, the advisor to student ratio, Ku's asking. Sure, wow. Ku, so, so it's, it's insane. <laughs> um, I, 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 I can't remember the figures exactly. I did it for one of the papers and I'll, and I'll, and I'll put the, the links to the papers in the chat in a minute. Um, but depending on how you look at it, it is about one, one academic advisor to, I, I'm going to lie, but it says about over a thousand students, but it could be nearly 2000. And if we look at what Nakada recommends, it's like way over the ratio. But then if you bring, if you separate out undergrad and postgrad, and if you bring in this, the peer advisor support, then the ratio decreases a little bit. It becomes more manageable. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Danny. If you could answer Thanks. Gavin's question on the chat. Well, thank well, you well, so much for that. And Thanks, everyone. And Lindy and them have to have their presentation right. now. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. That was really enlightening. Um, Lindy and Nokulonga, I hope you were able to access the, the link. Then there's Homozo and Innocent from Bits again. And they'll be talking about student sentiments during emergency remote teaching at Wits University. Um, thank you, Fatma. Good morning, colleagues. Um, allow me to share my screen. Can you confirm when the screen is sharing? We can see, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, good morning again. Um, may I just kindly confirm that my colleague no longer is in. This is work that was done by four of us, myself, Nogulunga, Kumuto and Innocent. Um, however, two of us are present here today to, uh, to share this study with you. Um, as you have indicated, we are looking at student sentiments um, during emergency remote teaching. This is in 2020. And we're also looking at the importance of these sentiments for advising um, academic, academic support. Um, my colleagues who came earlier have actually been talking about academic advising. They've been talking about different ways uh, of ensuring that this benefits students. So, we are taking this conversation further by analyzing student sentiments. I'm not going to go through what spend more time looking at. Um, can you still hear me, colleagues? Yes, thank you, Lindy. Okay, thank you. I was getting feedback that my connection. It is breaking up now. Uh, we're going to focus a little more on findings and the and the discussions. Now we are looking. We actually looked at the pandemic. Oh, can you hear me? You seem to be fading in and out. We can hear you yeah. now, but you okay. seem to be fading in and out. You're fine now. Cynthia, apologies for that. I'll try to change my name just now. Anyways, um, I was saying um, we looked at the pandemic as one of the catastrophes really that have affected the world. And this not being a new catastrophe, if we look back in 2005, uh, we had universities resorting to 
online courses because of uh, some catastrophe that had happened there, uh, a hurricane. And between 2015 and 2017, in our own context, we had um, FISMAS fall, that period where we actually had to provide alternative ways of providing teaching and learning to our students. And then the most recent one, obviously, is the pandemic, uh, which did not affect just sections, uh, but affected uh, teaching and learning worldwide. And this was because um, we needed to have a hard lockdown and ensure that people are safe. And this then resulted, or one of the um, ways of teaching and learning that we adopted or a, an approach that was adopted is the emergency remote teaching. And because of this emergency remote teaching, I mean, with, I mean, the term explains itself, it was emergency. I mean, it was adopted at a very uh, short space of time and therefore most universities were underprepared. Um, literature has this. They were underprepared to provide quality online teaching and learning. And in as much as they were underprepared, they however tried to provide innovative ways of continuing the, the academic project amidst the, the pandemic. And some tend to online teaching and learning, those who had resources brought in as much of these resources to make sure that the students continue to, to engage with the content. And we also saw the images of blended and online teaching and learning. Um, we do not want to claim that this only came as a result of the pandemic, but it could have been used in other institutions, but it became widely used. The use became very wide after the disruptions. And therefore, we, the, we saw the importance of technology again, not to say that it wasn't important before, it became uh, of significant importance to ensure that, and it also became a very key component of uh, education in, in that era. And like uh, we would all know, it has continued to, to become this. Now, just to provide the background of the study, um, we are looking at a previously advantaged um, higher education institute, if you may allow me to say that. However, the students from, um, the students from this institute are from a diverse socioeconomic background. And some of them come from low income homes, which also means that uh, they often need to be accommodated in residences that um, allow them to, apologies. They often need to be accommodated in university residence that allow them to access the different facilities that are available. And also this environment provides is actually conducive for them to, to learn. Uh, however, because of the pandemic, like we've just mentioned, the hard lockdown, many students were forced to return home. Uh, and some of their homes often didn't have appropriate infrastructure, often didn't have appropriate spaces or often didn't afford them the time to actually focus on their schoolwork and work on, on what's required of them to do. And more so it means their participation in the emergency remote teaching was compromised. And we also saw the socioeconomic inequalities being magnified. Also, if I'm to qualify here, we're not saying they were, these were not there before. Uh, socioeconomic inequalities have always been um, within our communities, within the systems, but they became magnified because of, of this catastrophe. And students, some of them were under pressure and they were uncomfortable and somehow they needed to let out this discomfort and express themselves. Uh, and they found different ways of doing this. The institution under study actually like I've said, it's in, in an advantage, previously advantaged institution. So efforts were made to ensure that devices are provided to students, um, hard and soft copy study material posted or couriered to students in different parts of the country where they actually experience, were experiencing internet connectivity issues to ensure that they could still participate um, in the project. And also uh, there were arrangements to ensure that data is provided for them. Uh, like I'm saying that we are looking at student sentiments, we actually uh, looked at the polarity of the student sentiments from a social network and 36% of the student sentiments were negative, 30% were positive, and 33% were neutral. 
um, and we do not the, the very limited differences between the negative, the positive and the neutral, all of them um, um, hovering around the 30%, 30 to 35% range, actually 33 to 36%. So that also tells us that there were sentiments that were, um, I mean, the categorization of the sentiments wasn't that, that different. Now let's look at what we aimed to get out of this research and the guiding questions. Uh, the key research question was to find out how uh, student sentiments can actually inform academic advisory mechanisms. And the sub questions, we actually tried to identify, we did identify the challenges that emerged, specifically those faced by the students during this period. And then we also looked at how the institution in question intervened um, and supported the students from the diverse economic backgrounds. And also we looked at um, the implications for different HEIs, actually maybe let me say for the specific HEI going forward regarding the academic advisory support. And our main focus is actually, or maybe let me say looking at the aim, we are looking at the future developments in academic advisory mechanisms without compromising the quality of teaching and learning and also developments that will ensure that um, disturbances in education are accommodated within the work that is done by the academic advisors. Coming to the literature, You, I'll start with the theory. Sounds like my yeah, connection might be. I think so. Let's do it. Okay, I'll proceed. Um, should I proceed, Fatma? Yeah, we we just having some problems with your connectivity, though. You we're not hearing your sound very well, or is it just me? Anyone else having problems with the sound? Same for me. Could, yeah. Couldn't hear well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're also, also struggling. Um, should I go back maybe and start from two slides before? Okay. Now I think I think you can stand the slide. Just continue. Okay. Just start from the slide here. Yeah. Thank you. Apologies for that. Um, the theoretical framework that we use is the activity theory, and I'll start by looking at the basic uh, model of this theory before we actually go into detail about it and how it affects or how it influenced the study that we have. Um, the activity, this activity theory was uh, confounded by Engelstrom in 1987, who also looked at the revised version of it in the next slide. It is basically an umbrella term. Activity theory is an umbrella term about how people collaborate. It's uh, about who's doing what, why, and how. And the reason why we use this theory is mainly because we find that academic advisors are part of a community. Academic advisors work within the university system, to working together with other different units as well. But the key outcome of the whole university and all the other different stakeholders that are involved is ensure that the student success there should be some tools that are used and looking also at the different rules that are provided to make sure that um, the different activities are governed going forward. Now, looking at the more detailed part uh, or the revised version of the activity theory uh, by Young and Hemp 2016, we'll find that, like I said, the key motive, the key motive is actually student success. And in this, case we've got subjects and the people who are key and we identify these as our students, the ones who consult the academic advisors for support. And for the rules, um, it's all the different policies and regulations that govern. And this is not just governing the academic advisors, but the whole system as a whole. And we're also looking at um, how people adhere to these rules, how people adhere to these uh, policies. And when we're looking at the community, we're looking at, we've subdivided this uh, into primary stakeholders. And this would be like the immediate university community. Our lecturers included also our academic advisors. But we also realized that for institutions to work, 
it's not just the it's not just the primary stakeholders that are involved. We also have secondary stakeholders that are involved, and these would be like our funders. I remember uh, colleagues spoke about how funding is an issue. Dan spoke about how funding is an issue. So we view those as our second stakeholders because they are not involved, although they are important. They are not involved in the day to day. Um, running of the teaching and learning process. And then the division of labor is looking at the different activities and how these are divided amongst the different stakeholders, amongst the different um, sections and how the activities are achieved. So coming to even greater detail, I've mentioned our students are the subjects because we studied work that was done during emergency remote teaching. Our tools are the online tools, the devices that uh, were used. I've spoken about the investor stakeholders. Uh, the outcome being an effective academic advisory system, and then the roles played by each stakeholders because there are different structures like we mentioned. We have to ensure that they have to play their roles effectively. Now, going further with the literature, um, if we were to look at emergency remote teaching, we do understand that it's actually a temporal shift of instructional delivery. So it is not um, a, an approach that is meant to last for a long time. It is temporary, but um, we do understand that it became very useful during the more teaching and learning because then it provided immediate solutions. Uh, it provided ways of transitioning from face-to-face -face instruction to the use of blended or hybrid courses. So at the time, it was very important that it's brought into place to manage the situation that was um, at hand. And this we've mentioned earlier, the readiness of HEI is not just the HEI in study. Uh, was Mandiwe, we've lost you again. Quite low. And this is the agency. It happens that sometimes they don't work or Okay. Okay, you can continue can you to start that slide, slide again. again. Yeah. Thank you. That um, we're looking at the term emergency remote teaching, which actually focuses our study. And the key thing to look at is that it's a temporary measure. It was brought into or it Hmm. Oh, I'm afraid, Lindy, we can't hear you at all now. It came into existence because there was an emergency face to face of. Okay. Um, just give me a second, colleagues. Glendivia must be changing her connection. Mm -hmm. If you just bear with us a couple of minutes, colleagues. May I ask if Glendivia's team members are around, if anyone else would like to continue with the presentation? Okay. Uh, I am around. Okay. Um, um, okay, the DV seems to be back. <laughs> I've just changed my connection. Uh, I'm not seeing it any better. That's much better, yeah. Just go back to. You can continue with the challenges. I think the ERT was sort of self explanatory there. Okay. Um, the key challenges faced by students uh, is that they mainly struggled with access to resources. And as a result, they, some of them, not all of them, 
did uh, express their opinions, also their frustrations, and they mainly complained about not having the devices that are required, not having internet access or stable internet access for that. And sometimes even being in places where there wasn't um, electricity or, or conducive environment. And we are aware that the hard lockdown also forced them to go to their different homes and that was challenging for some of them. Um, we are also not ignoring the roles that were played uh, by the HEI and other different support measures which were put in place. Um, of course, they were expected to develop strategies to offer online support and manage the situation. And most of the, this is not just about the investor understudy, but quite a number of them, of, of the HEIs actually uh, empowered their centers for teaching and learning with um, training staff, training students, conducting webinars and providing all the, actually capacitating the university community, making sure that they continue with the, with the teaching and learning. And software and LMSs that were used were also made sure that they are upgraded to ensure that they could handle the mainly online or blended teaching and learning. And in the specific institution we're talking about, network providers were conducted to ensure that they provided data um, to different students uh, on a monthly basis. And looking at, I'm not going to touch much on this one, though it is our key focus because um, academic advising has been defined um, earlier, but what I would like to focus on or what I would like to emphasize even further is the fact that there has to be a relationship between a student and an academic advisor. And this relationship is key. And what we're also looking at is what kind, excuse me, what kind of relationship um, should be there between the student and the academic advisor? Is it just a general relationship or what, what should constitute this, this relationship? And it's, it's been detailed that um, academic advisors usually results in student retention and more so among first generation students. And we are not assuming that the students who are studied in here are first generation students because a pool of students, we could not define, I mean, identify was first generation who was not. But we're also looking at um, having, like remember when I spoke about the relationship between a student and an academic advisor, we're looking at ways of having a proactive relation, I mean, a proactive approach to academic advising and also having a caring relationship maybe. And when we talk of the proactive approach to academic advising, we're looking at issues where the academic advisor actually um, foresees what's going to happen. Like in the situation where we had, could there have been ways of anticipating what could have happened? Maybe yes, maybe not. But could there have been a proactive way of looking at the situation and dealing with the, the student challenges that they were facing at the time? And one of the key important things really about academic advising is that at the end of the day, we need to have an, an empowered student. Um, I'll, my last slide is going to be on the methodology and then I'm going to ask my colleague to take over from here. We, this study is guided by the interpretivist constructivist paradigm. It is a qualitative study and the method used sentiment analysis like I indicated in the background. Uh, of the study. Data was gathered from a social network and then we identified the relevant Twitter, um, or let me say the relevant tweets, and these were between the 10th of May and the 10th of June in 2020. Then the data was cleaned to remove, I mean, as you can imagine, information from a social network would need to be cleaned first. Sometimes you've got uh, characters included there, so we had to clean this to make sure that we have data that we can analyze. And we do call the sentiments subjective because um, you realize that when people are expressing their frustrations, we cannot claim that they would be objective all the time. So we do acknowledge that. And uh, the analysis was mainly qualitative thematic analysis, which is going to follow after this. And our key unit of analysis were actually the student sentiments regarding the onset of of emergency remote teaching. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague.
Hai Nobluna. No longer. We can't hear you. I think you muted. Okay. Um, Noglunga has just shared with me that she's having load shedding. She's being load shed. Um, oh dear. Okay. I'll continue. Okay, great. Thank you. The key finding from the study is that uh, while the institution provided support, because we acknowledge they did provide the support, it is evident that not all students benefited meaningfully from the well-intentioned and purposeful um, interventions that were provided by, by the institution, hence the sentiments that we, we, we had. And I'm going to share with you some of the sentiments which we categorized into different, into different um, themes. Uh, we first categorize uh, sentiments that were mainly related to challenges faced by students. Um, students appeared to be quite under a lot of stress and they were also afraid of failing. They, they expressed fear of failure. We just picked, for some of them, we picked sentiments that we thought would actually bring about this notion that we have. Uh, like we have a student saying, we need to postpone academics until everything is normal. So if you, with them, we know that students would like to graduate at the end of the day. Some of them can't even wait. But when they get to a point where they feel the, the academics need to be stopped, it means they were under immense pressure. Um, there were also challenges re related to assessments and the exams, which also compounded the fear. Uh, we have a student saying, we are continuing as if there was no pandemic. Uh, the academic load is way too much. Submissions are placed the same way they, they would have been placed if they were having face-to-face -face teaching and learning. So it, it further, um, we, we, we get to understand how, how pressured they felt and how the assessments even made them uh, much uncomfortable because they were feeling they should have been adjusted in a way to accommodate that, I mean, it wasn't business as usual. Regarding the academic load, the previous statement also uh, attests to this, but it's also um, it, emphasizing on, on, on the pressure. Uh, we were, this is quite an interesting contribution because the student says, literally my phone has thousands of notifications from school. The assumption here is that the student is using their phone. They are maybe not using the devices um, that could have been provided by the university, but it also acknowledges that there were other students that could have been making use of their phones for the academic work. Um, communication seemed to be a problem as well. And in as much as the institution provided communication for the students, students were also expressing themselves in different platforms that they were, but it looks like maybe there wasn't much of a common ground. Communication was there, but maybe that communication could have been broken in a way. When a student says, can we have a clear communication as to what the conditions are? It means they could not, co communication could have been there, but maybe they had not accessed it the way that they should have. Um, the other thing that we have are the initiatives that were provided by the institution. And this is not at the images, like we said, as the project moved along. Um, we There's evidence that the, the the student council came to to became of assistance in to a certain extent they offered themselves they offered their assistance they they reached out to some students but also we need to view this with the uh, notion that they could maybe be having a high presence within the social networks that the students use to communicate so this is why we pick up some of their comments where they um, indicate that they are available to assist. But we also saw some, uh, or there's evidence that there are some senior students who avail themselves and who, um, who, who indicated that they could assist with the tutoring so to make sure that teaching and learning goes on. The, the, the gist Nadine, of- Nadine, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Uh, Nokulonga has just messaged me to say she'd like to continue the presentation. She has come back. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you.
Over to you, Nokolonga. We are running out of time. I just need to alert you. So it's really past the time, but you go ahead and you can complete okay, your presentation. I for that. Uh, there no, was no, no we completely down. understand. Completely All right. Understand. Um, I think you were done with this section, um, Lindy. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the the students later on in the um, uh, lockdown decided to help each other, as uh, Lindy has said, and they obviously became aware that students needed more, just more than uh, just uh, academic support. Uh, they, some of them needed food. They had gone back to their homes and they were some struggling. And remember, uh, in those homes, some people were no longer working. So they then uh, uh, sought help from Gift of the Givers and uh, the PSC. Uh, next slide, uh, Lindy. All right, so there, there were issues that related to digital equity and, and some of them I think have been pointed out, but I think this data actually is very helpful to have a, a clear understanding of what students experience. Yeah. Oh dear, Lindy, we we've lost no Kulunga now. Um, 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 it, it, I think you should just continue. Yeah. No problem. Uh, these findings are related to digital equity, and as we can see, that the students highlight that. Some of the, when a student is asking others, did you manage to download all lectures? It means there could have been challenges. Not all of them obviously had the same amount of uh, lectures or PowerPoints and stuff to download, but then it means it was an issue for them. Also, what we need to look at, why would a student want to download the lectures? Most probably because they want to go through the work offline and not be using as much data as they would be if they had to attend um, the, the, the other versions of the work. Um, some students mentioning that out of 150, there are only 35 students with access. I do not have access to electricity. That also compounds the situation. And those who had been accommodated on campus when they were now out of campus, they really felt um, they were they were they were being placed under pressure, like we've said. And we also have um, data issues that they were experiencing. And a summary of findings: we had our key finding first, but to break it down. It's clear that students had to ensure students had to ensure that either they get um, devices from their funders and those who could not, they had to ensure that they provide for themselves. And we can also pull up uh, the fact that the teaching community could not have been as prepared as they should have been because it was mainly at a show within a short space of time where they had to do the transition. And the quality um, could have been compromised because then if communication is going throughout, lectures are being loaded on the LMS and on different um, parts, but then students can are, are not accessing all of them, then it obviously means there is some compromising there. And inequalities magnified more so regarding the digital divide. And also we do see students actually kind of like organizing themselves and pulling up initiatives to support each other. And we see the peer-to-peer -peer support coming through. Now, looking at the future developments, now beyond what all this information that we've collected would mean beyond the, the ERT period, um, there's a new normal that we are in currently. This data is from 2020, and uh, we can see that students are being taught, and they are now interacting with lecturers in a different way, and actually this is being promoted. And, the use of online and blended learning or the, these online and blended approaches that are being used, maybe even the resilient pedagogies that we're adopting really need to be innovative so that going forward, the crisis, if it is to happen, because it will be, um, we cannot assume that we're not going to have any catastrophes in the future. So we need to have innovative approaches that will help us to, to transition maybe more in a smoother way than what than the way it was. And we are also pulling that there was some self-directed learning coming from the student's direction. 
and they got ways of trying to learn without direct supervision uh, by their lecturers. And we've spoken about the new approaches, but now we are now pulling them to the activity theory. Um, the flexible and resilient approaches that we've said um, need to be used, but they need to be used effectively. And here, when we talk about this, it means the community that we spoke about in the activity theory, which are in this case, the primary stakeholders, the, 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 the lecturing staff, and also including everybody else who's involved, they need to be very flexible in the way that they use the, the new approaches. And coming to digital equity, maybe some of the, which I think are being instituted in different HEIs, even outside the HEI under investigation, um, maybe all the first year students, as they do their registration, they need to be made aware that a laptop is a minimum requirement. You need to have it. Maybe things that were not being um, enforced previously. We don't know. Maybe this could work. Maybe this could have other implications, but it's a point to think about. And, and specifically for academic advising, we've spoken about it being proactive. We've spoken about advisors anticipating challenges that students may, may face. Um, some interesting information that we may pick is maybe because the platforms that I use are different, we actually do not see the academic advisor voice um, maybe responding to, could it be maybe different parallel platforms were used because we do not want to assume that the platforms that are used by students are the platforms that are used by the academic advisory team, but should that be this, the case, we don't know. Um, they, they need to provide necessary interventions you know, when we are being proactive. And most importantly, we're also adopting um, a notion of caring ethics by noting 2021 to say, when students and academic advisors in that relationship that we spoke about, whatever they communicate, there is the cared for, and then there's the carer. In this case, the carer would be the academic advisor and the cared for being the, the student. In each in their different roles as the carer and the cared for, they have specific responsibilities and they need to adhere to these responsibilities so that that um, engagement, that relationship that they have can work together for both and can work well for both. And in a crisis, like we've said, uh, we need to pull the different stakeholders, we did mention them earlier, and make sure that they are all working for the common, for the common good as um, indicated by the activity theory. We are concluding this by actually pulling the activity theory to, to, to the whole academic advisory support system. Remembering that we did have an outcome, but in this case, the outcome needs to be effective, an effective academic advisory system where the academic advisors collaborate and coordinate with all the different units that they work together with. Primary stakeholders included, secondary stakeholders included. And like we mentioned, the student, which is, uh, who is our subject, the one who's cared for according the, to the caring ethics, needs to have access to the tools, need to have access to the specialized tools uh, that are needed so that they, they can um, participate in the learning environment. In the next slide, actually, we talk about, in this case, the tools were the, uh, the, the, the gadgets that they used. Let's take, for instance, uh, in an institution who would have computer labs, but these computer labs are, are, are located within the, the, the university premises. When we have catastrophes, when we have issues where students have to be moved away, they still need these tools. It's not like the tools are not there, but it is the location of the tools now. So maybe the need to have um, accessible tools, accessible specialized tools. Um, we've spoken about the tools and the primary stakeholders, we've mentioned them. There are those within the university and those working outside the university, but they all need to collaborate and work together. Because when we talk this, of these specialized tools, then we start talking about the funders for this. We start talking about the network providers. We start talking about the umbrella body that provides the direction. And the division of labor, uh, we did see that there was training that was provided, but maybe this training also needs to, let's say when you talk about academic advisors themselves, the training needs to adopt the caring ethics is, um, is, 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 is suggested by Nodin. And we also looking at there are policies that will always be in place, but could the policies be monitored and evaluated constantly to make sure that as 
different stages, okay, they are also responding um, to the, the stages that the, the university community will be passing through. This is my last slide, and it is summarizing um, what we've just spoken about and emphasizing on um, an effective academic advisory system uh, that will benefit the subject, which is our students, but also the need of the well-located specialized devices, and then the rules that will provide all the guidance, not with um, leaving out our community. We also focus on the division of labor by all who are involved in this, but at the center of it all, the care relationship is the most important so that the cared for, the student, and the carer, the academic advisor, work together to achieve our goal, which is academic advising. Thank you, colleagues. I will stop here. Thank you, Lindy. More importantly, thank you for persevering despite all the glitches. Um, colleagues, uh, thank yeah, you. Colleagues. you for yeah. No, no, no. You, I mean, I think you've you've sensitized us uh, through your presentation. I think just with all the glitches as to what students went through anyway during ERT. So yeah, that was just putting putting it all together there. Um, any comments from uh, the participants? I think uh, Fazile did mention something about the sentiment analysis and perhaps looking at the use of social media. Um, oh no, I think she says. The use of social media skews the findings to, towards more negative sentiments. Do you want to comment on that? I'm sorry, may sorry, I can't sorry. open up my screen. My computer's also crashed. So oh. somebody could read Fazile. I'm just seeing uh, uh, Fatima, I'm here. I'm here. Yes. Thank you. Could you please Thank you so back? much. Thank you so much um, to Dr. Lin Liyue and Nobulunga. So, no, I was just curious about the sentiment analysis, um, especially mm -hmm. when we know the nature of social media. Wouldn't the results be skewed towards more negative sentiments? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, we, I do get that, but remember one of the things that we did with the background is to actually look at the polarity of the of the sentiments. And then we found that actually there wasn't that much of a difference. We had, I think, 33% of, 36% of negative, 33% of positive, and another 30% neutral. So they were around about within the same range. And we also, as one of the limitations, do identify that the platform that the students used is also makes way for subjectivity. So we do acknowledge that they would not go because people when they're expressing their their sentiments, they they they, they in most cases objectivity is, is compromised. However, that does not mean that the kind of information that we get they cannot advise us going further on what we need to to look out for in our academic advisory um, approaches that we use going forward. I'm not sure if that covers you first. Definitely, and very well done. This is really, really interesting work. Thanks. Thanks, Fuzile. And Dewey, just one quick question from myself here. Your yes. uh, use of the activity theory as a lens. Uh, did you find, how, how did you find that too? Was it, too, was it onerous? Was it uh, quite comprehensive and, and, and easy to use, um, you know, to sort of highlight and illuminate all the various power relations? For, yeah, just a comment, a quick comment on that. I'm not sure if I've, I've got the, the correct answer for you. To tell the honest truth, it was quite um, challenging, but we like challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, we felt it fitted uh, the study because we cannot look at academic advising as a solitary unit within a university. First of all, a university is a community with different units, with different structures. But at the end of the, all, of, of the day, everybody within the university, their main goal is student success. We do have academic advisors whose main goal, may, where academic success, uh, student success is mainly highlighted, but they cannot achieve this goal on their own. And also looking at the, this specific instance, we were looking at the onset of emergence remote teaching. We need a tool. So this actually made us see that this is the theory that will help us to, now we, we have tools, but not just any tools, they need to be specialized tools, but it's not just about specialization of the tools, it's also about where they are located so that they can be useful, otherwise they are not. And because we're also talking about issues which are outside the university, that's where the community came in to say, we have a community, yes, but it's not just a unified community, it's a community that has got 
internal and external stakeholders. Then we started identifying those, who the inter internal ones are, who the external ones are, and also realized that though the internal ones have the key responsibility of making sure we've got the outcome, but we also need, especially in the case of ERT, the external ones, our funders, our NSFAS to provide the devices, the um, online, the network providers, et cetera, et cetera. And also it we placed key on our, our object, which is the student, sorry, the subject, which is the student, because this everything that the investor community is doing is for the benefit of the student sure. most of the time. Yeah. Thanks, Ndibi. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us. I know we ran way over time, but uh, really, it was, it was such an informative presentation, and we really thank you. In fact, all the presentations, and I, I love the way they all sort of come together, and I think endorsing Dani's comment about the notion of referral and network uh, networks being so crucial to this whole approach that we move away from our siloed approach and that we reach out to the various entities uh, in the universities. And hopefully, yeah, this will lead to more considered design of our courses and eventuating student success. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you so much.